as deployed by the assembly comes into play, into play when uh, military hostilities have ended and political solutions to end the conflict are being pursued. In this context, it is important that the Assembly is a statutory and political body of the Council of Europe. Its actions, its actions and positions are political in nature and carry political weight and significance. If extreme caution and care is not taken, our actions could be instrumentalized or construed as heaven as having a political meaning that the assembly does not wish, wish to confer. Naturally, that means that we are more restrained and limited in such access and contact than the technical bodies of our organization that are responsible for the human rights monitoring bodies of the Council of Europe. The ac acceptance of such principles should also guide the work of such monitoring bodies. The, the focus of their work and accession should be on technical, should be on technical contacts at secretariat level, working outside of the public limelight rather than on high-level contacts that create considerable public attention and which are easy to be inst instrumentalized and abused to confer implicit recognition. The work of all bodies and institu institutional parts of our organizations should be guided not only by strict ad adherence to the principle of respect for human rights and international and humanitarian law, but also by a keen sense of political and diplomatic principle and sensibility. These are not separate worlds. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Senator Curran, for that very interesting um, uh, overview of, of Parliamentary Assembly action. And uh, clearly, the Parliamentary Assembly has a, has a very important role to play in ensuring that, I suppose, to use the theme of this conference, the light is still shone on, on, on many of these issues. Um, third point, then, is uh, just due to a logistics arrangement, we have decided to change the order ever so slightly. We're, instead of taking President uh, Chaka Nimani from the Constitutional Court of Kosovo right now, she's just arrived, but instead of taking her right now, we're going to go to the panel first and then have the President afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to just give the floor directly to Professor uh, Eva Nolan to, to introduce the panelists. This panel discussion is focused on uh, ensuring unrestricted human rights monitoring and advisory access to European territories, so Aoife. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and I, I think my microphone is working. My name's Aoife Nolan. Um, amongst other things, I'm Vice President of the European Committee of Social Rights, which is the body, of course, that monitors the European Social Charter. And I mention that because obviously our session is on monitoring bodies today, but also much of what we've talked about today and will continue to talk about today relates to the ECHR and the rights in that treaty. But of course, the things we're looking at unresolved areas of, in areas of unresolved conflict have huge implications for social rights as well, um, which in the Council of Europe are most comprehensively protected under the European Social Charter. And obviously, social, you know, uh, unresolved conflict harms social rights enjoyment in the countries directly affected by, by that conflict. I mean, you just have to look at the Ukraine at the moment. But it also has very significant indirect effects, which shouldn't be ignored, including four states, for instance, that are now receiving large, that historically and now are receiving large numbers of people, or those, who, or those states whose ability to meet the social rights needs of those for whom they are responsible is being affected by interruptions of access to goods and resources that are fundamental to the achievement of social rights. And the European Committee of Social Rights, the body that I'm on, 
obviously will have to address these social rights impacts in the context of areas dealing with unresolved conflict over the coming years in both our collective complaints and in the context of our reporting system. And given that on our quasi-judicial function, I'll say no more on that. But I do just want to flag as we begin this session and in the context of this very important conference where we're dealing with this crucial issue, that the Council of Europe, leaving aside the work of the European Committee of Social Rights, that a failure on the part of the Council of Europe and its many mechanisms and entities more broadly to pay proper attention, attention to social rights in the context of areas affected by conflict and more broadly would be a very grave error. So, having, having given my two pence on that issue and flown the flag for social rights, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce um, the speakers in today's session. I hope that you can see Olena on the screen in front of you. Can you? Not yet, Not yet but come the time, hopefully. Will you be able to? Okay. Well, let us just move on anyway. I'm not going to read out the bios of the fabulous people that we have with us today. The excellent program contains that information. Just to say very briefly that Claudia Lam on my left is the Deputy Director of the Office of the COE Commissioner for Human Rights. Claire is the head of, Claire Ovi is the Head of Department for the Execution of Judgments. The Council of Europe, who I'm sure will have lots to say following on from our panel just now. We've Mark Kelly, who's a long-standing member of the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, um, who will be speaking about the ongoing work of the CPT in the context of areas of unresolved conflict, but also Russia, so we look forward to that. And finally, we have Olena Ivansev, who is the Protection Manager for Europe and Central Asia of Frontline Defenders, a well-known human rights defender-oriented civil society organization that many, if not all of you, will have heard of. So the aim of, and ho hello, Olena, we can see you now, um, the aim of today, of, of this session, is obviously to have as much of an exchange as possible. And I realize I say that having spoken uninterruptedly for three minutes, but hey. <laughs> but that will not continue. Uh, but, I, but what we are going to start is, given the fact that we have people working in very different areas, we have different levels of expertise and familiarity in the room, we're going to start with very short presentations, maximum three minutes of the speakers, outlining what it is that they and their departments or their bodies do, and maybe throwing out a couple of initial thoughts about how that links with the subject of our session, which just to remind us is ensuring unrestricted human rights monitoring and advisory access to European territories. So, Claudia, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to start. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. And so I would like to start with uh, speaking of the Commissioner for Human Rights work dealing with the issues that we are uh, discussing today. Uh, to remind maybe the ba basics, that is that the commissioner is uh, uh, elected for a non-renewable mandate uh, of six years, and that today uh, it's the commissioner Miljatovic from Bosnia-Herzegovina who is the commissioner, and she will be uh, the commissioner until 2024. Um, according to the resolution that uh, established uh, the commissioner's office in 1999, the role of the commissioner is as an independent, impartial, a non-judicial uh, institution to promote awareness of and respect for human rights in the 46th Council of Europe member states, so in all member states of the Council of Europe. Uh, also important to point that the Commissioner has a specific role to play uh, with regard to human rights defenders, uh, further to the adoption of a declaration by the Council of Europe uh, Committee of Ministers uh, in 2008, inviting the Commissioner to provide strong and effective protection for human rights defenders across the region again. So the mandate of the commissioner relies very much uh, on one key word that I want to say here, that is cooperation. Uh, we work in cooperation with member states and all other uh, relevant actors uh, in uh, working on the field. And uh, the commissioner's main power, so to speak, is to address recommendations. This is really the role of the commissioner, is to address recommendations as how to promote uh, awareness and respect uh, human rights in the Council of Europe region. It's also possible for the Commissioner to intervene as third party in uh, the um, rulings, in the cases before the European Court of Human Rights. That's a possibility for the Commissioner to intervene. And the Commissioner can also use uh, Rule 9 of the Rule of uh, Procedure of the Execution of the, or the Supervision of the Execution of the uh, court's ruling, uh, and therefore the Commissioner can make written submissions uh, in this context as well. 
for the topic uh, today, um, I can say that the Commission has never done so for interstate uh, um, cases uh, when it comes to third party intervention, and it happened once for an individual case against two countries. Um, I think it was Thomas Hammerberg at the time, the Commissioner, who did uh, uh, the third party intervention. So, importantly, when it comes to areas of uh, conflict, uh, in 2004, uh, Committee of Ministers' Declaration also invited, encouraged the Commissioner uh, to continue paying a particular attention to these situations. So it's really about continuing because the Commissioner has done so. And uh, doing that by further developing fact findings and the formulation of targeted recommendations. So we are clearly within the mandate of the Commissioner for Human Rights uh, to deal uh, with human rights uh, in areas of conflict. Uh, if I give a very quick geographical overview to finish uh, on this, of what has already been done by the Commission, and we can maybe uh, develop a bit more the kind of work that has been done there. But just to say that, uh, from what I could see, uh, all commissioners travelled to Kosovo, and very recently, actually, Commissioner Mijatovic did a recent mission there, where she discussed transitional justice uh, and social cohesion, freedom of the media, and uh, women's rights and gender equality. And the memorandum on this mission is under preparation. When it comes to Northern Cyprus, also all commissioners went there. Uh, this is the same for uh, Transnistria in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, and recently, again, Commissioner Mijatovic went there in 2020, I think, and there is a report uh, containing an annex on the country visit to Moldova, containing an annex with observations concerning human rights issues discussed in Tiraspol. When it comes to Georgia, I think I would like to mention here the significant work of Thomas Hammerberg, uh, uh, who went seven times, I understand, to South Ossetia, and also traveled to Abkhazia, but other commissioners also uh, went there, uh, but um, I mean, Thomas Haberberg was particularly uh, active uh, at the time uh, for this region. Uh, when it comes to uh, Ukraine, uh, Commissioner Muzhnyaks also carried a mission to Kiev, Moscow, and Crimea in September 2014 and went to eastern Ukraine, uh, I think it was in 2015 and 2016. When it comes to Nagorno Karabakh, no commissioner has been there. Uh, and um, However, we have, uh, I would speak about it as well, a memorandum that was published by Commissioner Mijatovic on the humanitarian and human rights consequences following the 2020 outbreak of hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh. So we have a written output on this, and maybe I can yeah, uh, elaborate that's, a little bit. Listen, little that's more. a fantastic overview and really thank helpful. You. It sets the scenes for us really then digging in in our later conversation. So thanks so much, Claudia. Without further ado, Claire, can I hand over to you? And let's see if the microphone works. Oh, well, let's see if I can work the microphone. I think it is working. Yep, yeah, is that right? Okay, so thank you very, very much. Um, so I'm, I'm Claire, I'm the head of the Department of Execution. And I think it probably would be uh, helpful for some members of the audience if I just outline a little bit what uh, the execution process involves. So after the European Court of Human Rights issues a judgment finding uh, one or more violations of the convention, uh, that creates a legal obligation on the respondent state to take uh, measures to implement the judgment. And these can be individual measures, which are really aimed at the, the applicant, the person who brought the, the case to the court, to put that person as far as possible back in the place that they would have been had the violation not occurred. So that could be releasing them from detention, it could be uh, putting a stop on a, a deportation process if there's a risk that they'll be ill-treated if they're deported, can be family reunification. Um, so any number of kind of individual measures which are aimed at the applicant who brought the case. But there's also an obligation on the state to take general measures to stop uh, repetition of the violation. So to stop similar uh, violations happening for other people or for the, the same applicant. So... Um, the general measures can be extremely wide-reaching, and they can take a long time. They can be very expensive. You know, we have cases, uh, for example, very, very many cases against many member states about uh, prison overcrowding and poor conditions of detention, which can involve, um, you know, major investment in infrastructure in, in the prison estate, also uh, changes to judicial practice, changes to legislation to divert people out, out, of, out of detention, so they can really, you know, uh, be very wide-reaching and very complex uh, general measures. 
Um, the, uh, as with the, with the, um, the European court uh, system, as with the convention system generally, we operate on the basis of the principle of subsidiarity. And so it's in the first place for the uh, respondent state to communicate with the committee of ministers, with the Department of Execution, um, what, how the, their vision of the judgment, what uh, type of measures they think are necessary, and what they intend to do or what they have already done. And, and they do this kind of communication. Uh, the, the kind of uh, jargon we use for it is action plans and action reports once they've actually taken all the measures they think they need to take and they think that the case can be closed. And these documents are public. You can search for them. We have a database called Hudoc Exec. You can search by the case name, um, and you can see all the communications which the respondent state has uh, sent to the Committee of Ministers about the measures they're taking. Um, it's also, there's, there is, we've already heard, um, there, there's a kind of possibility for um, the European Commission on Human Rights, also for uh, national human rights um, institutions, for civil society, for applicants, also to communicate with the committee, so to respond sometimes, to comment on what the state's doing, to, uh, to say whether they think it's good enough, whether more measures need to be taken. And those communications are also public. It's also possible for, we're talking about interstate cases, so for the, the other state, uh, the applicant state, also to comment, um, and those comments are, are public. Then every uh, three months, the Committee of Ministers meets for three days uh, for these human rights meetings. Our kind of jargon, again, is we call them DH meetings from the French, Trois de l'Homme. So um, these meetings take place in March, June, September. We've got one in a couple of weeks, um, and December. And at these meetings, the Committee of Ministers typically examines kind of 30 to 40 cases. Um, and the, the, those meetings are, are, are private, they're held between, behind closed doors, but the product of those meetings is public, and uh, the kind of product is decisions of the Committee of Ministers. So th this is how the Committee of Ministers expresses a, a view on what the state's been doing, what more needs to be done um, to, to implement the case. And so, as I say, those decisions are public. Again, you can find them in Hudoc Exec. Um, my department, which is made up of, um, we, we've got about 60 people in the department, a mixture of lawyers and uh, assistants and administrative staff. We're all independent lawyers, yeah. And uh, we provide an analysis, we provide um, assistance to the Committee of Ministers, uh, our analysis of what the state's doing. And those notes are also uh, publicly available on Hudoc Exec. I'll just very, very mm -hmm. quickly. So our, the, part, the department, our role is really to advise the Committee of Ministers, but also very importantly to advise states, to help states in implementation, to uh, travel to the states, to talk to stakeholders, and to really do everything we can to make sure that uh, judgments are implemented. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Claire, because I appreciate it's a very complex system, but it's very useful to have it uh, laid out in such clear terms. Mark. Uh, thanks very much, Aoife, and good afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation. I think we must be sitting in the University of Galway by now, <laughs> uh, after lunch. So thank you to the University of Galway, um, to Andrew specifically, and to the Department of Foreign Affairs for the support. Mm. I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, or, or CPT. What is the CPT? It's a non-judicial means of strengthening the protection of detained people against torture and ill treatment. So it's a complementary non-judicial mechanism to Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It's based on visits to places of detention. And it can be any kind of place of detention, anywhere where a person is detained as a result of a decision by a public authority. So not just prisons and police stations, but homes for old people, homes for young people, airport transit zones, everywhere you can think of, including places of de facto detention, which is obviously quite important for our, our discussion this afternoon. Um, the CPT is a proactive 
mechanism. It's the committee that decides to carry out the visits as opposed to uh, the reactive mechanism of the European Court of Human Rights that waits for applications. And we have a very wide range of power under Article 8 of the Convention to rapidly mention a couple. Um, unlimited access to territory, uh, unlimited access to places of detention and the right to move freely within those places of detention uh, and the right to speak in private with people who are deprived of uh, their liberty. And there's also a system of uh, follow-up visits after we've made our reports and recommendations so we can look at whether improvements um, have been made. This system uh, applies in all 46 member states of the Council of Europe and actually, and I think this is something we're going to come back mm -hmm. to, it also technically applies in another 47th uh, state that uh, I think we'll talk about in some more detail. Um, as for the relevance of the topic, um, very briefly, uh, as Andrew mentioned in his introduction and Mary Robinson reiterated, over the years the CPT has carried out visits to very many uh, grey zones and we maintain uh, a monitoring type process in relation to Kosovo, where we're still very uh, active. And as Andrew also made clear, in these uh, grey zones, it is uh, upon the most vulnerable people, including people in detention, that the impact of living in a grey zone can be sharpest. Uh, so our concern as a proactive anti-torture mechanism has to be that grey zones don't turn into black holes mm -hmm. for human rights monitoring of detention. And the, the possibility that uh, grey zones become what Andrew has called normalised exceptions don't either create or enlarge the spaces in which there can be impunity for acts of torture uh, or ill treatment. So the topic could not be more relevant for, for the CPT, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to contribute Fantastic. to the and discussion. Th thank, thanks for those comments, Mark, because I think they'll serve as a really useful springboard as we go forth, especially about the 47th state. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Anyway, Olena, it's a pleasure now to turn to you, and if you don't mind just doing a quick three-minute introduction to talk about your work with Frontline Defenders, that would be fabulous. Yeah, sure. I uh, hope you can hear me well and sorry for joining online, but uh, that's, that's a pleasure and thanks for your invitation. So we as frontline defenders, we work to improve protection and security of human rights defenders who are at risk and who are uh, under persecution because of their human rights work. Uh, of course, including uh, the grey zones and uh, including human rights defenders working in grey zones as well as working on grey zones from other places. And um, I'll be mostly talking about uh, on the behalf of human rights defenders, actually, rather than uh, talking more about our work, but of course, uh, in uh, protecting them, uh, we do so by uh, providing different security consultations, capacity building trainings, grants, and other support for practical uh, needs of human rights defenders, as well as different types of visibility and advocacy support for them. And we've definitely been lucky to be in uh, everyday, basically, contact with human rights defenders, including the ones working in areas of conflict. Uh, and I want to mention that in some of these areas, of course, these are human rights defenders who became the main source of information about human rights violations in the area, uh, bearing in mind that uh, many international organizations don't have access or regular access to these places. And uh, let me... Uh, probably be quite straightforward and go to some of the examples. 
uh, is going to Crimea, uh, and I've been working on Crimea for the last eight years since Russia's annexation. Uh, it's important to say that, for example, human rights lawyers that we are in touch with, they've been the only ones able to provide uh, basically legal support uh, to victims of human rights violations for the last eight years, as well as they definitely became a source of the only source of basically verified information and evidence uh, on the cases of human rights violations on the peninsula. And uh, because we're focusing on protection, so we definitely look at the Council of Europe uh, and ECHR particularly as mechanisms uh, improving that protection for human rights defenders in Crimea and other places. And just to mention uh, our 2017 Frontline Defenders Award winner, Emil Kurbedinov, who is a human rights lawyer, a prominent Crimean Tatar human rights lawyer who has been working defending the rights of uh, Crimean Tatars, as well as other uh, Ukrainian activists and journalists and human rights defenders working in Crimea for the last eight years. And he's the one who has been uh, persecuted for his human rights activities. He has been arrested two times in 2017 and 2018. And his case is pending in Strasbourg. Uh, and uh, what I've got, uh, I've got a message from Emil just within the last several days uh, that he wanted me to communicate with you is the point that uh, he is feeling and the feeling of his colleagues is that uh, the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights could definitely, if made, uh, let's say, uh, timely could have made a difference for him and for his colleagues uh, and provide additional protection for them. Unfortunately, of course, the judgment, the decision has not yet been made and uh, we've seen a disbarment of three colleagues of Emil just in the mid of July. Okay. Uh, so using this opportunity of the of the first intervention i i do raise that that issue and getting back to the point that has already been mentioned many times today about the interstate cases versus the individual applications this is something that um human rights defenders who work with in gray zones have in mind and they do uh ask us to kind of uh, raised the question uh, concerning if and to what extent some of the cases of human rights defenders who play a crucial role in the areas of conflict and whose cases are pending in Strasbourg, uh, if there is any chance to uh, grant uh, priority status on these cases, for example. Elena, that's and fun. I think, yeah, Can I, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, thanks. I'm so sorry to interrupt because it's fascinating, but I want to develop that a bit more as we go through the questions. But thank you so much. And of course, bringing the people whose human rights are at issue to the absolute heart of today's event is absolutely fundamental if we're going to have a meaningful conversation about the purpose and the aims and the, the modalities of human rights monitoring. So let me, let me throw it open there. Let, let me throw open the floor now. We have a series of kind of general questions and people can engage with them as they're interested. But I think the first one, I think, Claudia, I'll steer towards you and then welcome comments from others. Is this, you know, can you give a sense of, um, of the way in which um, the Office of the, of the Commissioner for Human Rights views areas of conflict and the way in which it, it engages in its work? You've already given a few examples, but I wonder if maybe there's stuff you want to build on there and develop further. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. So maybe I can start with the core principles that the mm -hmm. commissioner's work uh, applies, if you want, uh, when it uh, relates to areas of conflict. Uh, and one of them, I already mentioned it, but I think it's particularly relevant for uh, this uh, topic, is the independence. This is really the basis uh, of the, the work of the commissioner to build it on its uh, independence, that is from any entity, be it a member state, be it also a non-state uh, actor. So independence is a key word here. 
And then it goes along with the respect of sovereignty, I mean, uh, international law, uh, we work within the framework of international law, obviously, and within the framework of the Council of Europe, so when there is a cessation of a membership, or when there is a new arrival, for, arrival, for instance, as a member state, this will be taken on board uh, in the work of the commissioner uh, in full line with the, the mandate of the commissioner. Another important work, uh, word sorry, is uh, impartiality. I mean, impartiality and objectivity. This is uh, really uh, a principle that uh, all commissioners uh, implement in their work. It's not a political body, it's not a judicial body, it's a body uh, that uh, has to be impartial and objective uh, in uh, their work. Uh, that's particularly important in a situation, for instance, where you have two member states that are involved, um, so to keep this uh, objectivity and impartiality uh, all the time present. Another core principle is the do no harm principle uh, that is very important, I think, when you are in contact with the local population, when you are in contact with human rights defenders there, uh, they need to be protected against reprisals and certainly not uh, increase the reprisals against them uh, through our, our work, so it's very important that we keep this do no harm uh, principle in mind uh, in our work. Mm -hmm. Now about the aim of uh, the commissioner's work in these areas. What are we aiming at? Well, as I said, in general, it is promotion uh, of awareness of uh, human rights and respect for human rights. And that means then, therefore, for all people who are affected by the conflict. Uh, and that means including those who live in the area of conflict. And there it's very important, of course, to raise uh, the humanitarian and human rights law uh, standards to make them uh, make people aware of them and uh, that they are protected, these standards, for those who live in the areas of conflict. But it's also, also important for those who have left uh, the area of conflict. Uh, we give already the, the, the example of uh, migrants who have to leave, who have to cross a border mm. and uh, have to flee uh, conflicts. And uh, the Commissioner Mijatovic recently went uh, several times uh, on mission to neighboring countries, our team as well. Uh, myself, I was in Hungary, for instance, uh, on a mission to uh, discuss and uh, uh, evaluate the situation uh, of the Ukrainian uh, refugees, people fleeing Ukraine uh, conflict uh, there. So this is an example, but you also have internally displaced persons uh, who not, do not necessarily cross a border, but who have to leave uh, the place of um, conflict. And then you have families of those who died or disappeared who also uh, would need their human rights to be respected and promoted. When I say human rights, I mean all rights, so all people, all rights, mm -hmm. and this includes social uh, rights, uh, as you mentioned uh, as well, and um, not only civil and political rights, but also right to housing, right to education, right to health, decent living conditions of all the people I mentioned before, those staying or those leaving. Um, and now to the main messages and recommendations of the commissioners that uh, we can uh, see from the work on these regions. We already several times mentioned the fact that no, none of them is quite similar to the other. We have to take the differences into account. However, uh, I mean, in general, what I can say is that before any area, uh, sorry, before any conflict arises, the commissioner will always ask for prevention of a conflict uh, and also being careful about, you know, the rhetoric, for instance, uh, from politicians, for instance. Once the conflict is there, I mean, the main recommendations of, of, uh, is, of course, to kind of rebuild peace and stop the armed conflict, but also to deal with all urgent humanitarian aspects during the conflict. It is also, and I think this is an important aspect uh, of our discussion today, to give full access to human rights and humanitarian bodies and ensure an international presence and assistance in the places that we mentioned. And also, uh, when it comes to the consequences of the conflicts, once the conflicts maybe is not uh, present anymore, uh, then uh, Commission I also ask to deal with missing persons, uh, the problems of missing persons, and to uh, deal with human rights of the families uh, uh, concerned with transitional justice issues, I think this is an important keyword as well, fighting impunity uh, for serious human rights and humanitarian law violations. And last but not least, the Commissioner has always stressed the importance of re-establishing the dialogue, building uh, the bridges between the civil societies, 
avoid hate speech, and prevent, of course, further escalation and promote the escalation mechanism. That's I mean, I think it's, it's very interesting what you're saying there because it really demonstrates the, the very wide-ranging mandate and the kind of holistic range of issues. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to turn to you, Claire, and I want to hear what, you know, about the Department of Execution of Justice and how you, uh, <laughs> execution of judgments, sorry, execution of justice, uh, execution of judgments and, you know, how you engage with conflict in the work. But I also, as part of that, it would be helpful not just to know about how you engage with it, but maybe about the challenges that a conflict context in particular poses to you in your work. So kind of digging into that. Thanks very much. Maybe I should just uh, start by very quickly just giving an overview of the kind of, of the relevant cases that we're actually working on. So uh, we have um, a number of individual cases and also an interstate case uh, concerned with Northern Cyprus, uh, which raise uh, issues of um, the property rights of displaced uh, Greek Cypriots, the um, wide-ranging rights of the Greek Cypriots who remained uh, in the Carpus Peninsula of Northern Cyprus, and uh, also the whole issue of missing persons and investigations mm -hmm. into deaths. Uh, here, I mean, for, the, for Northern Cyprus, uh, um, I mean, our, our, the, 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 our engagement with, with, um, with um, our approach to conflicts is really is through the prism of the court's mm -hmm. judgment. So uh, we do not engage directly with the de facto authorities. We have a respondent state, Turkey. For those cases, Turkey was found to have effective control. And so our contacts are with Turkey, the respondent mm -hmm. state. Uh, but Turkey, within its kind of delegation and the information it sends us, uh, has um, uh, um, uh, people from uh, yeah. from the de facto authorities of Northern Cyprus who uh, are taking measures to implement the judgments. But all of our information comes through Turkey. Uh, we've had a certain amount of success in those cases, so particularly to do with the living conditions of people in the Carpus Peninsula. Mm -hmm. We also, through very lengthy litigation in the European Court, there is a property um, tribunal which has mainly been paying compensation but has also had uh, ordered some restitution of property. And um, the whole of the, the court's litigation and the execution process also um, gave a massive push to the uh, UN's Committee for Missing Persons. So that's been uh, mm -hmm. quite successful in identifying missing persons. And uh, in Northern Cyprus, uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of police uh, missing persons unit has also been yeah. set up. So there's Can been I, some success there. That's yeah. fantastic. Can I interrupt you, though? Because I mean, I think that's re it's very interesting hearing the background yeah. and where you're at. But I think it would be really interesting to think of the day to day and you know, you do your work in conflict affected yeah, areas yeah. and non conflict of areas and in terms of your day to day what are some of the challenges that you face when it, you're dealing yeah, with issues yeah, yeah. About i mean it really conflict? it really varies so that was the kind of success story it really varies from case to case so for the transnistrian cases where russia was, was the respondent state for many many years we were in dialogue there that I mean the first of those cases for 2014 katan we were the department was in dialogue with Russia. Russia never ever accepted that they had uh, okay. jurisdiction. They didn't accept the court's findings, so that was obviously a major major problem. Um, uh, uh, we, by the you know fairly recently, we decided to get kind of creative. As as I said, um, the uh, the whole system is based on the principle of subsidiarity. So normally it would be for the respondent state to come forward and say what measures they think are needed. Russia never did that. And so um, in the end, the secretariat with the mandate of the, with the blessing of the committee of ministers actually came up and did an analysis of oh. the measures that were needed. And we were just preparing actually to go and do quite uh, in-depth consultations in, um, in Moscow and uh, Chisinau and possibly even in Transnistria. Um, to try and get those implemented, but then uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, so that all went out of the window. Uh, for the, um, so I would say that's a major problem, is that quite often the respondent state just doesn't accept the yeah. court's findings and won't assume jurisdiction, um, so won't do anything about it. Then we also have cases, uh, two individual cases, one against, which have been mentioned earlier, one against uh, Armenia, one against uh, Azerbaijan, to do with the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Here, I'd say the major problem is actually that it's a dynamic conflict. And so uh, we saw uh, the renewal of hostilities in 2020. 
Uh, now, you know, at the time when the court looked at those cases, the court found that Armenia had effective control over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and over the surrounding territories. Yeah. Now that whole landscape has changed dramatically, and so uh, um, it's difficult possibly for Armenia. You know, the court is saying that um, that uh, it's up to the respondent states, the states with effective control, to, um, to set up a, a property commission and to ensure restitution. And now Armenia is saying, well, actually, we don't really have effective control of those areas anymore. So we mm -hmm. have to kind mm -hmm. of, we've worked out all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff that we were talking about with Armenia and Azerbaijan. We have to start again. Um, uh, um, and then we also have the two uh, Georgia against Russia interstate cases. Um, and there, I mean, I don't think I've got enough time, but we had major, major problems again with Russia. Again, we had to get quite creative. Now we're going to have to get creative because Russia is not a member state anymore. But there's still, um, you know, just even in terms of paying the just satisfaction in the first interstate case and very wide ranging general measures which are required for the second interstate case. And I don't think anyone's prepared just to say that because Russia has, is no longer a member of the organization, that's the end of the story for those cases. Just one other thing, I think the other major, major difficulty with, um, with executing uh, these kind of cases is, um, is hostility. You know, they're, they're very, very emotive. Um, they're very difficult, even with the best will in the world. I think it's, you know, for a state that wants to cooperate, it can be quite hard to sell that to the population yeah. back at home that they're going to give money to the enemy, that they're going to take measures for the enemy when their own, you know, they might have their own displaced uh, persons from the conflict yeah. that also need support. And so that can be very difficult um, for, for the member yeah. states concerned. That's fascinating. And this notion of kind of conflict almost as an innovator or a driving innovation. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested, just moving over to you, Mark, and it's obviously a very different context, this, uh, the Commission for the Prevention of Torture. But perhaps you could talk a little bit about how conflict affects your work and, and perhaps whether or not you've, whether or not you've had to innovate in the face of that, or how you've innovated. Sure. Um, so maybe just to focus on the practicalities and the more mm -hmm. operational uh, side of things. Operating in conflict uh, areas for the CPT is a crucial thing to do, because when there is conflict, there's usually a heightened risk that people deprived of their liberty can be ill-treated. So it's very important for the mandate to be active. And just to give you some examples, we can go back nearly um, 30 years uh, to our involvement in visits in the north of Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to the holding centres for terrorist suspects or people suspected of terrorism in Castle Ray and also in Gok Barracks in uh, in Armagh, and that was in 1993. It was um, about a year prior to the paramilitary ceasefires. So during that visit, we had armed uh, drivers. We had cars with number plates that were changed on a, mm -hmm. on a regular basis during the visit, so they couldn't be spotted and identified. Hard to imagine now uh, on, the, on the island uh, uh, of Ireland, but that was the, the the beginning of our work in conflict zones. And then in the early uh, 2000s, we were active during the Second Chechen uh, mm -hmm. War, uh, in particular going to Grozny while the bombardments of Grozny were, were continuing. Um, the Russian Federation had uh, denied access to the International Committee of the Red Cross. They had denied access to Mary Robinson, who at the time was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. But they couldn't technically deny access to the CPT because we had a conventional uh, right to go there. Um, but it's one thing to have a conventional right to go to Grozny while it's under bombardment, and it's quite another to actually uh, go there. And the team went there in the end in Russian military helicopters because it was the, the only way uh, to, to get there. Um, and then more recently, we've had a phase of really active 
engagement in gray zones uh, in the Transnistrian region of, of Moldova in 2000, 2003, 2004, 2006, and 2010. And in the Abkhazia region of, of Georgia, we had high level talks in 2008 and uh, a visit, a, a single visit in, in 2009. For each of those visits, we had to do something which is more difficult for our colleagues in uh, uh, some other parts of the Council of Europe. We had to engage with the de facto uh, authorities because otherwise we wouldn't have had access because they actually controlled the places um, of detention. But we also had to be very careful in terms of our direct interlocutor remaining the <laughs> member state of the Council um, of Europe, and that's the, the state to which the recommendations were, were, were addressed. And then in addition to that, we have a long-standing special arrangement uh, with the United Nations, with UNMEC, the United Nations mission in Kosovo, and with, uh, uh, at the time, with KFOR, the NATO mission in Kosovo, and we monitor conditions of detention in Kosovo, and we report to UNMIC. So the report is actually sent to a UN agency and the responses come from, uh, come from the, the UN agency. Can I just add one thing very, very briefly, very briefly yeah. um, to, I, I hope, make a kind of a bridge to some more things that we want, want to talk about. When we concluded that agreement with NATO um, at the time um, with them, um, Secretary General uh, Yap de Hoop Schaeffer. Um, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe was a, a British uh, politician called Terry Davis. And he said at the time, we have succeeded in resolving a long-standing anomaly in the human rights enforcement system in Europe. This arrangement will help to ensure that there are no exceptions to the absolute prohibition of torture and mm -hmm. human and degrading treatment throughout the member states of the Council of Europe. And unfortunately, those words have not turned out yeah. to be prescient. So I hope we can talk <laughs> a little bit more Absol about no, I, you know, where, we are, where we are now and yeah. where we go from here. Absolutely. No, I think it's, it's very certainly, I think there were great achievements and then perhaps Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic certainly overstatement at that point. Elena, can I just turn over to you and talk, you know, you've spoken a little bit about the pressures faced by human rights defenders, but perhaps your own work in terms of engaging with and supporting human rights defenders in conflict areas. Can you talk a little bit more about that and some of the challenges you face there compared to, say, other areas in which frontline defenders work? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, this is a lot about access to the territories, as we've already all kind of mentioned, and as well as about the protection mechanisms that we can use. And of course, with Russia being expelled from the Council of Europe, uh, it looks like we have even less mechanisms to uh, rely on, uh, less leverage to use, and uh, even the ECHR judgments we've been awaiting uh, more likely uh, wouldn't have any any effect on, on Russia's regime currently. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty challenging taking into consideration that basically the usual softer uh, powers are not working and uh, we we haven't had much leverage uh, towards Russia within the last eight years, let's say. And uh, again, if talking about Crimea, if talking about Eastern Ukraine, for example, and currently it's it's getting it's getting even more complicated. So while kind of thinking about any potential support mechanisms for human rights defenders who are working in, in the gray zones. Uh, we've been also brainstorming and thinking uh, about the initiative that has actually been in place some years ago. Uh, it was an idea about having uh, uh, some kind of a, a convention on uh, protection of lawyers in gray zones that could basically 
contain uh, some of the standards uh, in terms of securing, uh, basically enabling security and independence and ability of the lawyers, uh, independent lawyers to exercise their uh, professional obligations and provide legal assistance uh, to the victims of human rights violations in gray zones. Uh, so uh, this is something that uh, our, our beneficiaries see as, as a possible kind of relevant mechanism, because of course, if there are some clear standards recognized by the Council of Europe members, that could be an efficient tool. But again, taking into consideration the fact that Russia is not a member anymore puts, puts more questions. But uh, the, the important point that uh, Ukrainian human rights defenders have been raising throughout uh, the last six months is that uh, there is, of course, a feeling of uh, that basically international organizations cannot cannot provide any uh, efficient mechanisms currently for the current situation. But uh, there is a hope that this war in Ukraine could be used to develop some of the efficient mechanisms for the other potential gray zones in future. So uh, by suggesting this convention on lawyers or that could be done maybe in the form of a resolution, based resolution, which uh, will uh, not probably have the same effect, but still could be a, a supportive uh, mechanism in terms of ensuring this protection for defense lawyers, who, as I've already mentioned, uh, remain one of the main sources of information and evidence in the cases of human rights yeah. violations. Yeah, no, I think that's, mm. thank, thanks, Alina, because I think that's a really, you know, you've, you've identified the problem, you've talked about the Ukraine being a springboard for actually potentially better protection in the future, and this idea of a convention for lawyers is of, you know, of huge interest as a potential practical step. I want to just, because you've spoken in your comments about Russia, there's been various other references in Claire, et cetera, and I'm just going to throw it open to everyone now, but I think possibly starting, starting with Mark, actually, because this issue of um, the expulsion of Russia from the Council of Europe and how it affects work, uh, human rights work in areas of conflict, and how do we address that gap? How do we address that issue? I mean, I think just turning to the particular situation around the work of the Committee on the Prevention of Torture, it'd be interesting to hear from you more on this, Mark, because it's not, the departure from the Council of Europe hasn't finished Russia's relationship with the CPT anyway. No, I mean, it's, a, it, it's a, apparently, a bit harder to get away from the CPT than simply being expelled from the, <laughs> from the Council of Europe. Um, a decision was made, uh, a well-known decision by the Committee of Ministers on the expulsion of the Russian Federation um, back in, uh, in March of, of this year. And in the, the resolution, there was a very clear decision that conventions that were only open to member states of the Council of Europe would cease to have effect for the Russian Federation in, in March. And then there was another decision in respect of the European Convention on Human Rights that it would effectively remain in force uh, for a period from March until about two weeks uh, from now, the 16th of, mm -hmm. of September. So the convention is technically still in, in force uh, for the Russian Federation. But there was a third element to that decision which has received uh, less attention, which is that if a convention of the Council of Europe is open to non-member states, that the Russian Federation would remain bound by that convention. And the, the CPT's convention is indeed open to non-member states, okay. even though no, 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 number, no non member states have actually signed or, or ratified it so far. So what that means is, at least in theory, uh, the CPT could carry out another monitoring visit to the Russian Federation uh, tomorrow. And indeed, the Russian member of the CPT attended our, our last plenary meeting back in, uh, in July. But the reality, uh, of course, is, is somewhat different and the Russian Federation 
as um, withdrawn effectively all engagement with the 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 organization the clearest evidence of that disengagement i think is the fact that um, they're no longer talking to the european court of human rights they're no longer talking as i understand it to the section on the execution uh, of 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 judgments um, and if subsequently if participants are are interested i'd be happy to talk a bit more about you know what that might actually mean in in practice well if if the cpt were to be able to yeah. go back to the russian federation what might what might that look like but maybe i'll yeah. maybe no, i'll I, stop yeah. there for now. no not all, and i'm sorry because i'm i'm being brutal cutting people off but it's simply so that we can get through yeah. the different interventions but i mean coffee breaks are, and dinner are there for a reason absolutely and i think that's really interesting this idea of an avenue that is frankly completely unexplored yeah. but shouldn't remain um, unexplored. The other thing that should be said just as a footnote is there's a real paradox in the current situation politically and legally because the Russian Federation has been expelled from with mm -hmm. great drama from the organization but actually about more than 80 percent of the conventions of the Council of Europe are open to non-member states yeah. so in principle there's a whole panoply of obligations by which the Russian yep. Federation is still bound. And uh, working through what that means in practice, I think, is, uh, is a big challenge. And it might be a conversation for yourself and Olena to have separately as well, given the work that Frontline Defenders is doing in these areas. Claire, I just want to pass over, because I think you had a, a, a few comments to make on this point as well. But. Yeah, actually, that's very good, you know, just to build on what Mark said. So the, um, the uh, Russian Federation is still bound, or is still a member state of the European Convention on Human Rights until uh, the middle of this month. But thereafter, there's still, there's a, there's a kind of everlasting legal obligation on them under the convention to implement the judgments which have already been issued by the European Court and any future judgments that might be issued by the European Court. But um, in terms of practice, I mean, as I explained a little bit before, anyway, even when Russia was a member state, it was quite tricky, particularly for these kinds of cases to, um, to, uh, to get any cooperation from them on the implementation of these judgments. Um, now we're, I mean, the Committee of Ministers has taken a decision to continue uh, examining cases against Russia. There's a very strong feeling in the Committee of Ministers that Russia shouldn't be left off the hook and that there's still a value in doing this. And so at the DH meetings, we're still examining Russian cases, including mm -hmm. the two Georgia-Russia interstate cases at the next meeting, um, uh, and also some individual cases, Navalny, for example. Um, and uh, part of the value of that is, is, is declaratory. So the Committee of Ministers is still issuing uh, decisions telling Russia, telling the rest of the world, uh, telling the international community, telling victims, telling civil society in Russia what uh, the Committee of Ministers, what the Council of Europe thinks are Russia's continuing obligations in those cases. Um, I think we will have to, and I, and I hope we do get to a phase quite rapidly where the committee does get a bit more creative. I mean, I think there is, uh, again, I don't want to generalize, but I mean, for example, for the Transnistrian cases, a lot of the actual work, uh, because some of those, so there have been improvements in some, in, uh, to do with some of those issues. For example, to do with the, the, um, the operation of the Latin script schools, which was Catan, and some other issues, but most of that has been achieved through Moldova, um, engaging with the Transnistrian authorities under the auspices of the OSP, OSCE. Um, you know, we are messaging also, oops, to, oops, sorry, to uh, the de facto authorities through the decisions which the Committee of Ministers adopts. And I think there is some work which was, which was a bit touched on in one of the sessions this morning. Um, to be done also in terms of reparations, seizing Russian property mm -hmm. and so forth, to pay some of the just satisfaction. But I won't, I, I know you want me to shut up, so I'll shut no, up. Not, no, can I be clear? I would love to do this all afternoon. I'm just conscious that sadly we have to share the event with other sessions. No, but it's one, and it's fascinating, and it, you know, it gets the conversation going. Claudia, can I quickly get your thoughts on the, uh, the Russian conundrum? Yes, thank you. Um, so when Russia was excluded from the, the Council of Europe, the commissioner has continued uh, basically to deal with the situation, with any situation that would involve Russia, when it has an impact on the human rights of the people living on the territory of a member states. And this is why, for instance, the commissioner published a memorandum 
on the human rights consequences of the war in Ukraine on the 8th of July, uh, mm -hmm. following a visit, actually, of the commissioner uh, in Ukraine. So, you know, the work of the commissioner goes on uh, for those uh, people who live in, on the territory of a member state that are affected by um, uh, measures that are taken by the Russian Federation. So this remains a, a possibility for the commissioner. And also, um, the visit was then followed by a memo, but there was also another activity maybe uh, that was interesting to see the, the range of uh, possibilities for the commissioner to, to act. The commissioner facilitated also a meeting between NGOs from Ukraine uh, and NGOs from the, you know, like Bosnia, uh, from the former Yugoslavian region, if you want, on sexual violence. Uh, so it was interesting to have these uh, NGOs uh, exchanging uh, expertise and experience to see how best they can help victims of sexual violence uh, in Ukraine. And. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is also referring to what you, you, you mentioned, uh, Claire, is the fact that um, the commissioners is, we will remain. You meant, I mentioned third party intervention and Rule 9 uh, submissions, and it is our understanding that the commissioner remains competent for Russia as long as the court and the committee of ministers remains competent as well. So I think uh, this is uh, how we, we see it uh, for the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Claudia. Mm. Olena, I think you've kind of given your thoughts on Russia, so I'll, I'll park that here. And in fact, what I want to do now is we have eight minutes left and we will finish at quarter past sharp. Um, and I'd like to take a few questions. I'm going to take questions in a row. I would ask people keep your questions as short as possible. Ironic coming from me, I know, but as short as possible to maximize the opportunity for people to ask questions. And also, please introduce yourself because it's important to know. So let, let, me, let me take, I'm going to take three initially. So I think there's a lady in, in, a lady in white sitting here. I can see a number of other people as well. So can I, Ilaria, if you don't mind. So the shorter people are, the more questions we can do. I see you. Thank you. Thank you, all the speakers, for their the valuable insight. Let me introduce myself. I'm representing the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. Can't really hear. I don't think the Sorry, we can't hear. Sorry. You're the representative of the Foreign Affairs. I can repeat the question. It's fine. It's, it's uh, I'm representing the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia, and I thank you, all the distinguished panel, uh, members in the panel. My question is following. Having the institution of independent and impartial uh, human rights commissioners you. institution. Okay, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. I, I mean, one option is to stand up I and just the shout. The microphone's not yeah. turned on. No. Okay, maybe, I wonder, could we borrow your microphone yeah, for a second, yeah, yeah. Claudia, so, we can, so we're not delaying on time. Let me, uh, will I swap and we can, yeah, great. Right, so your question quickly <laughs> sorry <laughs> After, impartial and independent institution of human rights commissioner it's a great achievement for the council of europe system we all welcome and uh, value the valuable work you are doing is politicized. Sorry, I think there's an issue actually with reception for the microphone. It's not you. Speak yeah, loudly. totally. Speak loudly. Speak loudly. Yeah. Loudly. Yeah. Technically. But we really do need to. Yeah. So. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We could definitely hear that. May I take the lady sitting at the back in the flowery dress?
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gillian. An exemplary question. I can see, I, sorry, I, I know that Roisin Mulgrew from Galway was there, and I can see other hands too. Roisin? Yeah, I just for Loudly. Marvellous, thank you. I'm going to take a fourth question and then we're going to do a quick round and I'm afraid the rest, forgive me, are going to have to wait till coffee and dinner. The gentleman at the front. Uh, yes, my name is Claude Rochelle and I'm Dr. Joseph. I wish to thank you very much for the organization of this event. Of course, uh, very much we thank you and this uh, initiation. It's, it's very much in time, I would say. At the same time, of course, I want to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs who are there. Okay, uh, no, no, I, I forgive me. But we just, if we can go really quickly, okay, yeah. I will, I will Thank you so much, but yeah. Uh, I will try. Uh, so let me say that it's very much important to use the, the right terminology and the, the right wordings. Because when we talk about the Georgia conflict, it's, uh, it's not just the uh, frozen conflict, sometimes with the here, some the time, or the so-called uh, post-conflict conflict. It's very much dynamic, ongoing, because we have the, the cases of torture, of murder, of kidnapping of the people. Uh, I'm very much delighted to, to, to hear that regarding that, that, uh, that Russia is not a member of the Council of Europe, but they are still bound to those obligations. They don't respect the different one, but they are still bound. And of course, uh, my, 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 it, there was a uh, minor uh, bit of question from, from your side, I suppose. But can you just elaborate a bit more? How is it possible to make Russia to be uh, accountable and to exactly to take judgment of the, of the Council? Uh, of the Court of Human Rights. And my final question will be about the, you know that the ceasefire agreement of 2004 of the Russian Georgia war was uh, mediated by the European Union. Would you find any mechanism, this, uh, of course, again, the Russians don't respect any of those, uh, none of these pockets that have been signed to exam. What would be the mechanism or the tool that you might advise or envisage to make Russia to fulfill the agreement of being happy? Wonderful, thank you so much. No, I mean, really important questions, and I'm sorry for cutting you off. Now, I'm going to very quickly turn to Claudia because the first question you had received from our first speaker who was so brave dealing with all the technical issues. If you can, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, um, so, you know, I mean, how can you be more proactive, I mean, uh, in, uh, in respect of this? I mean, first of all, there are challenges uh, in the commissioner's work. Um, it is a flexible, a rapid response mechanism, and the aim, uh, uh, when we deal with uh, areas of conflict is really, in principle, to have a mission there, to go there, to uh, have a first-hand information from there. This is most effective. This is what we consider as being most effective and uh, always what uh, is seeked in the first place uh, is to uh, go to, to the region in question, but then there are challenges uh, that we are confronted with I mean, you, you said that uh, the Gillian's question was an exemplary one. By which I take it you mean you put one of your colleagues in the position. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, that, that probably is the right way of putting it. Because yes, Wales is obvious uh, in terms of the people who play a, a, a responsibility. Um, I'm officially elected to continue the treaty of peace, which is a, um, in my view, the crucial capacity that Britain ever had, that he's ever had. But I will give you my personal. <laughs> view, and it is strictly my personal view, I think it was a mistake at that point for the treaty to, to happen. And I think it was particularly uh, a 
Japanese that would have meant for them in their active from 2010 to me politics. I really do think from 2014 to present, the, the CPP should uh, and should have become active in, in I think that we should have been uh, more conspicuous um, at that regard than, than we've done since then. I think we should have run for all of uh, the other occasions. And crucially, I think now we should make a difference more about health security than physical uh, security. So there wasn't a sort of a huge um, read across in, in where we would take that. And I think there was another part. Was there another part to your question as well? We moved it there. But ca you can catch up with me on the coffee break uh, for, for, for the rest of it. And, I, and I, just to the ambassador of Georgia, if anyone knew the real answer to his question, Absolutely. I think they would be uh, they would be very wealthy indeed. So, uh, Claire, can I ask you to? Yeah. So I'll I'll try and give an answer to the uh, to the distinguished ambassador of Georgia. So um, as as in fact Bjorn Berger mentioned uh, in his introduction, the committee of ministers at its ministerial session in Hamburg uh, decided that it would uh, review its working methods. Uh, um, in relation to interstate cases particularly, um, but also just, uh, just kind of um, delays in implementation of the court's judgments. And we, we the Secretariat prepared, uh, were working on, on a kind of briefing paper on this, then uh, work stopped when, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine because Russia is obviously the main respondent state in a lot of these uh, cases. Um, but I think we will uh, start that work again. Um, I mean, the, the kind of, the, it's a kind of weakness, or, or, but it's a characteristic of the whole of the execution process that we don't, we don't have very many tools. It really does depend on political will. Uh, the main tool is kind of pressure from other member states. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at the moment, um, everyone, the other member states are really focused on the, you know, the immediate um, fallout of the, or, or continuing um, conflict in Ukraine um, and, and energy crisis and so forth. So I don't think they're using any, if they're having any contacts with Russia, they're not using that to talk about implementation of judgments. But there will come a, a time, no doubt, when, when that is a more viable proposition. I also think, as I said, I think we could be creative. The, the CCBE, so that's the, the European Council of um, Barristers and, and Law Associations, have been talking a long time of uh, or the idea of having some sort of a process in, in a national process, actually, for seizure of assets for payment of uh, judgment debts for ECHR cases. This is something we could also, or the, for the Committee of Ministers to look at. So I think there are various creative ideas, but nothing on the table at the moment, but, but watch this space, <laughs> basically. So we can yeah. see concrete challenge, but also as a, a force for innovation. Olena, I'm conscious that you have this huge challenge of doing the session virtually. Do you want to have the last word? Do you have any responses to the questions asked or maybe final comments you'd like to add? No pressure if not. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, listen, thank you so much. And I'd like to ask, you know, first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for bearing with the speed it up, speed it up uh, attitude around the chairing. But I'd also like you to join me in very sincere and grateful thanks to our fantastic panelists, Olena, who isn't with us, but is very much with us virtually, and to the panelists who are here with us in this room, because it's been a really informative, exciting session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again um, to, to all of you, to uh, Aoife, Claire, Claudia and Mark for, for really an absolutely fascinating um, discussion which I'm sure will spill over into this evening's uh, meal and, and there's lots of food for thought there so thank you very much for that indeed. Um, without further ado and with one eye on the clock and also on people's faces who are getting decaffeinated as we speak but uh, we're going to move on to my next speaker and it gives me really tremendous pleasure 
to introduce my next speaker. Um, we, we shifted the program because unfortunately the president had uh, a, a logistical nightmare, I would put it like that, uh, but she's here and her team and uh, Judge uh, um, uh, Estrefi Pecci is also here and I'm, I'm really pleased that, uh, that you've made it. The, the next session is uh, to look at the maximizing the effectiveness of the European Convention on Human Rights um, in a territory which is not uh, yet uh, a member of the Council of Europe and is, it does fall into this broad category of uh, a region uh, affected by conflict and contestation. And this will be a perspective from the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. The next speaker is uh, President uh, Greta Chaka Nimani. And Greta is uh, President of the Constitutional Court of Kosovo uh, since um, uh, 17th of May uh, uh, 2021. I don't think that's correct, actually. Is that correct? Okay, 2021. Um, she has, um, she's been a judge uh, since uh, 2015, uh, but until her appointment uh, as a constitutional court judge, she served as a senior legal advisor and team leader with the Democracy and Governance Office of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID. She has extensive accolades and experience, and you know I'm not going to go through it all, but I, I do uh, beseech you to engage with her later. Uh, President Chakanamani, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you and welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, honorable uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll start with an apology for um, being late. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we have missed the first part uh, of the uh, conference, which we so much looked forward to. Uh, but we're delighted now to be uh, together with all of you so that we can discuss a very important uh, topic of ensuring the unrestricted access of human rights monitoring and advisory mechanisms uh, in all European territories. Before I begin my uh, remarks, although at a disadvantage for having missed uh, all the discussion during the day, uh, I would like to thank Andrew Ford, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of Kosovo, for all the work that he has done in organizing this uh, excellent uh, conference, but also, importantly, for his significant role in accomplishing the important vision of the Council of Europe Office in Pristina to strengthen democracy, rule of law, and human rights protection. I will be speaking to you briefly about the effectiveness of the European Convention on Human Rights in Kosovo and um, taking into account the previous panel and the pace, I'm gonna try to speak a little faster uh, and uh, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, and in doing so, um, I will briefly set the context. Uh, we'll continue with the features uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights implementation in Kosovo. We'll conclude with some key challenges, and then we'll be looking forward to any questions you might have. Uh, I will make every effort to stay away from any political statements. Uh, having said that, I think I will begin with one. Um, <laughs> and it's important because, uh, as uh, you know, it's important to set the context for the features of the European Convention on Human Rights application in, in, in uh, the country I represent. Uh, as you know, uh, Kosovo has declared independence in 2008. It has since been recognized by more than two-thirds members of the Council of Europe and um, everyone but five in the European Union. Uh, there are certainly different points of view in um, the, um, let's say, the um, from the international law perspective uh, on uh, its legality, uh, although it has been settled by the International Court of Justice, but the remaining issues are currently be being resolved through a uh, EU-facilitated dialogue between Pristina and um, uh, Belgrade. What matters for me to say is that I don't think Kosovo falls within the category of gray zone as defined by PACE. Um, and we could discuss this uh, after my uh, points. For two primary reasons. First, it is not under the control of any other authority, de facto or de jure. And I understand different points of view on this very simplistic sentence. And second, it is a country in which the convention applies freely and effectively 
although without the corresponding uh, monitoring and advisory mechanisms, something that uh, I will explain and get uh, to in a bit. In support of my arguments, I will only use the judgments or decisions of two international and or supranational courts. The first, the International Court of Justice, the second, the European Court of Human Rights. The first confirmed that the unilateral declaration of uh, Kosovo was not in contradiction with international law, while the second, while gradually and elegantly, um, confirmed that Serbia cannot be held accountable under Article 1 of the Convention for its positive uh, uh, obligations in enforcing the Convention rights. There's three cases uh, from the European Court of Human Rights that are very important to keep in mind. Behromi and Saramoti against uh, Austria, uh, Azemi versus Serbia, and uh, uh, DL against Austria. The first one is pre-independence, the two others are post-Kosovo Declaration of Independence. The first one implies the sovereignty of the former Republic of Yugoslavia over the territory of Kosovo. The second and third one uh, imply that there is no jurisdiction under Article 1 for the Republic of Serbia over Kosovo. This leads me to six features that I want to outline for you in terms of how the European Convention is applied in Kosovo and what are its features. One, as it's clearly known, Kosovo is a not, a high, it's not a high contracting party to the Convention, and thus um, does not uh, uh, apply within the, it does not fall within the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights for the purposes of Article 1. Two, based on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, no other entity exercises authority um, over Kosovo for the purposes of Article 1 of the Convention. Three, it has constitutionalized without ratification the European Convention on Human Rights, making it directly applicable mm. to its constitutional order. Four, it has given the status of the source of law to the case law of a foreign court, namely the European Court of Human Rights. Um, five, it is an example where the Convention applies freely and substantially effectively. I will get to this. Uh, even compared, in my view, to some of the member states. Uh, and six, it is an example in which the Convention applies without its second chapter, namely the European Court of Human Rights Supervision Authority. More specifically, the Convention has been applicable in Kosovo for the last 21 years. Uh, it was initially applicable in 2001 through the constitutional framework when Kosovo was still an entity under international administration. In 2008, when uh, after the Declaration of Independence, it continued to be directly applicable. However, there is a turning point in here, a novelty, an interpretation tool, and a, an interpretation mechanism. Let me clarify. The new constitution included, number one, the establishment of a constitutional court with the authority to interpret the constitution, including the European Convention on Human Rights, with a hybrid composition for the first 10 years, including one-third composition with international judges, including former judges of the European Court of Human Rights. And two, the provision through which required that any interpretation of human rights and freedoms in the Republic of Kosovo must be compliant with the Convention and more so in harmony with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, these two features, um, coupled with a um, uh, historical and political context, um, enabled the court to, the constitutional court, in, when established in 2009, to start creating a very suitable environment for the embodiment of these principles into the legal and constitutional order of Kosovo. I could very briefly say that in the last uh, decade plus uh, uh, a few years, 
the Constitutional Court of Kosovo based on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, and not only, also the recommendations of the Committee of Ministers, also other guiding documents of the Council of Europe, uh, has developed a significant amount of case law, including but not limited to institutional procedural guarantees of Article 6 of the Convention, and then uh, right to life, right to property, right to privacy, right uh, to uh, freedom of speech, association, discrimination, a lot of case law uh, uh, there as well, uh, including protocol number 12, which most of the Council of Europe member states have not ratified, uh, and we have already uh, implemented and used it in our case law. Additionally, the court ruled, and this is important for the embedment principle and for the subsidiarity principle, as well as for the principle of effective legal remedies, that all local authorities in Kosovo are obliged to follow the European Convention on the Case Law of the Human Rights, number one. Number two, that in case of any contradiction between local legislation and the convention principles, it's the letter that um, applies. And number three, that when courts in Kosovo decides on, decide on questions of, of human rights, in case they are uncertain about the constitutionality or compliance with the convention of a legal provision, they should suspend the decision making and refer the case to the constitutional court based on the incidental control constitutional mechanism. Um, this has gradually built a tradition in which not only the constitutional court heavily, and I could also say solely, but there's other eight international instruments directly applicable in Kosovo, including the Istanbul Convention more recently, apply on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, but it has already also sorted an environment through which other public institutions in Kosovo defer to it significantly. In cases even with the lower courts in the country referring to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, in discussing gray zones um, and whether there's something uh, from the Kosovo features that could be discussed, um, and I'm careful about this because I already, in my um, uh, view, excluded Kosovo from the green zone uh, definition. Um, but there are, I think, two important features why I think made Kosovo a very sustainable uh, environment for the embodiment of the convention principles. The first is political historical, and I will qualify this. Second is technical. In terms of political and historical um, a factor, uh, for the purpose of this discussion, I will limit it just to the history of the Kosovo constitution making process. For to simplify this discussion, I will only say that it falls under the continuously evolving concept of the internationalized constitution-making process because it developed in parallel with the ongoing status negotiations that were UN-facilitated, but finally not UN Security Council endorsed in terms of final status settlement, which Kosovo, through its own declaration of independence, took the responsibility to implement, including through its constitutional order. What happened was that the Kosovo constitution is heavily based on best international standards and best European standards, included and also includes not only eight international, now nine, with the latest amendments, uh, instruments that are directly applicable, but also very specific provisions in terms of Kosovo's requirement to comply with international laws and obligations. There's a other issue that I think it's a little bit underestimated, and this is the lack of previous constitutional tradition in Kosovo. And I say this carefully because this, one, uh, this sentence has some nuances. But for the simplification of the discussion, I will just say that when the Constitutional Court was established in 2009, it was tasked to interpret a brand new constitution of a brand new declared state with no previous case law to refer to. So there was a gap, a void, which in the Kosovo context was felt in terms of abstract control with a common denominator of Venice Commission opinions, recommendations of the Council of Ministers, and a common denominator of a case law of the other constitutional courts worldwide when it was applicable. And in terms of individual rights, with the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. The deference to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights by the Constitutional Court when it was initially established 
truly created the basis for the embodiment of these principles into the um, uh, application, interpretation, and subsequently protection of human uh, and fundamental rights. Um, I will not, this brings me to the technical factor, um, and I will simplify it to just say it's the Council of Europe. There will be bad news later on, but uh, at, this, at this point, I will say that the Council of Europe played a critical role in Kosovo pre- and post-independence in terms of providing significant amount of assistance in terms of democracy, rule of law, protection of human rights, uh, protection of human rights systems, including a significant amount of assistance for the Constitutional Court itself through training and mentoring programs, which was very successful also due to its absorption capacity and will for ownership and sustainability. Um, but it was a partnership in, first of all, increasing the knowledge about the convention, then establishing the necessary mechanisms in order to implement it until it becomes, and this is a gradually process, a mindset, an institutional culture through which human rights and freedoms guaranteed through the convention are um, uh, effectively applied. I am not going to say um, that the application of the convention system in Kosovo is without challenges. These challenges are political or technical, are um, uh, also required to, uh, I mean, related to the need to improve continuously the professional capacities of the legal community, to raise awareness among the people. Um, but I would like to focus my discussion, and then we can talk um, uh, subsequently on two key challenges. First, um, well, I'll, I'll rephrase, the lack of or unrestricted um, limited access to uh, councils monitoring and advisory mo uh, mechanisms. In terms of monitoring mechanisms, the situation stands better than to the supervision authority of the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights, which lacks completely, and that's a major problem which I will get to. In terms of the monitoring mechanisms, I think the Council, Kosovo, and the international community that was present primarily there until 2008 and then um, until the end of the supervised independence in 2002 have found creative ad hoc arrangements in order to provide Kosovo with access to these mechanisms um, for um, its own benefit. I mean, this was, there is, uh, a significant culture of will and commitment to embody these principles as a country who is committed to peace, rule of law, and democracy. These include framework uh, convention protection of national minorities, European Charter on Regional Minority Languages, the Prevention, the Committee on Prevention of Torture, a number of mechanisms which have been present in Kosovo and have assessed and provided recommendations in Kosovo throughout the, uh, throughout the years. There is a big missing piece, however. Chapter two, we lawyers speak by chapters. Chapter two, European Convention on Human, uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, the, notwithstanding that Kosovo directly applies and implements the convention, it falls short uh, to qualify it as effective implementation is if it is not supported by the supervision of the European Court of Human Rights. Kosovo citizens are the only one, at least in the Western Balkans, that do not have a legal remedy, that do not have access to the European Court of Human Rights. And even worse, the public authorities in Kosovo, including the Constitutional Court, are the only ones in the region who do not have the oversight of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, this does not only affect the implementation of the convention, but in a country like Kosovo, uh, democracy that is progressing continuously, it also affects rule of law. Um, 
This because access to the court would not only provide the citizens of Kosovo the, with an effective legal remedy at an international level, but I'm convinced that the supervision of the European Court of Human Rights decision-making of the Constitutional Court of Kosovo would increase its credibility, but it would also strengthen the accountability of other public authorities in Kosovo in exchange, resulting in increased public trust and directly contributing to more vibrant democracy to which Council of Europe and the European Union have invested so much for. Um, I want to end this with an emphasis of a contradiction of an applicable convention minus a critical chapter. And this is something that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, one could say that Kosovo has made the unilateral step of simply uh, constitutionalizing the convention and the council doesn't have to respond to this unilateral step. And we could all, I think, agree that I could argue, uh, counter-argue this very uh, forcefully. Um, it is truly important for the European Convention system and the human rights protection system not to be instrumentalized by politics and in order to, and to um, employ creative solutions, perhaps similar to the monitoring mechanisms, uh, in ensuring the supervision of the European Court of Human Rights uh, over the public authorities in Kosovo. Now, the elephant in the room and the best solution is to simply grant um, uh, the membership to Kosovo's um, deserved uh, membership to the Council of Europe. Um, after all, a combination of a convention system and the supervision authority, it is the essence not only of the European Convention, but also of the preamble of the convention itself. Uh, I might have raised some issues that um, might want to have, uh, let's say, uh, more back and forth discussion. I am available for any questions or comments you might uh, have, and I thank you all for your patience uh, and time. Thank you. I might just actually, President, ask you to hold, yeah. wait for one yeah. moment. There might, I, I realize we're over time for coffee, but if you, there might be a burning question that somebody might like to take the opportunity to ask the President. If that's the case, we can take just one or two, but if not, we'll go straight to coffee and we'll follow this up over dinner. Nothing burning, okay. No problem, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm here with uh, my colleague, Jaj Remzie, with Vetan, our um, uh, Director of International Relations. We we'll look forward to meeting all of you to throw out coffee and uh, have uh, any discussion you want. And Andy, thank you, this is a great opportunity for me. Thank Thanks you. so much, thanks again. So, we will break for uh, a 50, we're 50, a little 50 minutes late, but I think it's, uh, it's certainly well worth it for that uh, really, really useful intervention. Can everybody take your seats, please, and we'll move on with the programme with what is now our, actually our final uh, formal part of the conference programme for today. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your all enjoying the conversations, and hopefully they'll, co they'll continue into the evening. So we've had an extremely interesting day, an extremely interesting afternoon so far with many, many different perspectives, many different inputs uh, on you know, how the system uh, functions, could function better, limitations, challenges, opportunities, innovation, as we've seen in the, in the case of, of Kosovo and elsewhere. Um, and now our final panel discussion really is, I suppose, a, bro a slightly broader um, topic around how do we actually achieve a more practical and effective European human rights system. Um, and I won't introduce each and every person and give you the ba the, their backstory, but just to say that the, the panel, uh, the, the session will be moderated uh, by my colleague, Dr. Ed Bates from the University of Leicester, just to my left. Um, the other speakers uh, include the Public Defender of Georgia. We're very pleased to have you with us and thank you sincerely again for traveling so far and so long to be with us. Uh, Nino Lamjaria. Uh, we also 
have uh, the, uh, the, the Director of Legal Advice and Public International Law of the Council of Europe, the Council of Europe's legal advisor, uh, Jörg Blakowicz, you're very welcome. Uh, we have uh, the former Commissioner uh, for Human Rights of the Council of Europe, who obviously has unique insights into the, the practice of that institution from his experience, but, but current um, European Director for Amnesty International, Niels Musnix. Thank you again, Niels, for being with us. And last but not, not least, uh, we have um, a very strong civil society voice uh, from, uh, from the Moldovan, from Moldova, who de dealing with the uh, particularly human rights situation in Transnistria. Um, uh, so we have Pavel Kazaku uh, from Promolex NGO. So I'm going to give the floor to Ed Bates. We will uh, aim to finish this panel discussion at five o'clock. So Ed, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll just stand up while I get underway as I'm hidden a little bit by the podium there. Uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this event. My name is Ed Bates, as Andrew has said. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating the organizers on this fantastic event. Um, if they're uh, th this must be the most focused uh, concentration of attention on this topic probably that there's ever been, and that is a, a great um, um, tribute to those organising this event. Uh, I have been author of a book, uh, a textbook, on the law of the ECHR, um, and a new edition of that is going to print soon. And its introduction to, in the introduction to that book, we look at prospects for the convention. Of course, there we see narratives about the caseload challenges for the court, interstate cases, Article 18, bad faith cases, legitimacy crises in the past for the court. And we should, of course, be mentioning this as a topic. So I'll be making sure to get that in there as well in that. Um, just a couple of further thoughts by way of uh, reflective introduction into our session today. Um, the ECHR is the centre, probably, of the universe of human rights protection uh, at Strasbourg, but um, our session today, and as we've been hearing today, is also to look at other aspects of that human rights universe. And there's a broader universe than Strasbourg itself. Remember, going back to the convention, that we read the preamble to the convention, and it refers to the states taking the first steps for the collective enforcement of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 75th anniversary is next year. So let's remember that universal declaration backdrop to this. Now, again, thinking about the convention, um, the Interlaken uh, reform decade over the last uh, 10 years or so, concluding in 2020, focused very much on the future of the court and the effectiveness, effectiveness of the convention. What I'm sensing from today is that there needs to be renewed focus on the committee of ministers and the political actors that uh, work their way into the effectiveness of the convention. And maybe we'll be hearing more of that today. This session is uh, entitled Towards a More Practical and Effective European Human Rights System. We've been hearing about aspects of that system throughout today. Uh, that includes PACE, the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights, the European Social Charter, and others and our panel are very well placed to reflect and observe on the themes for this session, which is in the nature, uh, according to the email, of a fireside chat, although that doesn't seem quite to fit on the 1st of September in a gorgeous sunny day out there, but uh, we'll progress nonetheless by going through uh, each speaker and speaking to them um, one by one. The details of each speaker can be found within the booklets that you've received here. So I'll take a seat at that point and turn to my left and uh, say hello to uh, Niles, uh, Niels uh, Musniex, who, uh, as we know, um, was former Commissioner for Human Rights at the Council of Europe, and we heard about that role in the last session, now uh, European Director for Amnesty International. Um, so, Niels, if I can ask you briefly, please, to, uh, if you could sum up your experience of engagement uh, with areas of conflict in your role as commissioner. So looking back and reflecting on that, if you could, please. Yes, thanks. Is this working? I guess you don't know yet. Um, <laughs> yes, I guess since we're on the graveyard shift, we'll have to be pithy and short. Um, my experience was, I think I look at work in these conflict areas as being important, uh, frustrating, difficult, and sometimes impossible. Uh, I think it's important because these areas are really isolated. We're talking about 10 million people in Europe, and I'd say at least half of those people live in pretty severe isolation from the rest of the world. If you've been to Transnistria or Abkhazia or South Ossetia, or, they're not really prime tourist destinations. Hmm. Uh, and they don't have a lot of international presence. Um, 
and uh, at least those people who share our values are, are really uh, yearning for some kind of contact. Um, I think it's important also because uh, I found when I was commissioner that not only many governments but many civil society organizations really uh, encouraged me to work there because the Council, the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights is one of the, I think one of the few instruments or institutions with a, with a sufficiently broad mandate with the flexibility and independence to be able to go there. I think some of the treaty-based uh, bodies have a much more difficult time navigating how they, you know, how they, how they publish a report and, and, and who's responsible and so on. The commissioner can kind of fudge these issues and, and get away with it. Um, it was frustrating and, and difficult uh, because even the commissioner doesn't have access everywhere. Uh, I tried over six years to get access to Abkhazia and, or South Ossetia unsuccessfully. I'm pleased that my successor uh, succeeded. Um, I was told regarding uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, I was, uh, the Armenian authorities encouraged me to go there. When I raised this with the Az Azerbaijani authorities, they said, you can go there, but then you'll never be welcome in Azerbaijan again. Uh, so it was quite clear, and the cost of going to Nagorno-Karabakh was such that I didn't want, since all of my friends in Azerbaijan were in prison, I wanted to visit them and work on their cases from within the country, rather than uh, focusing solely on Armenia and, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, partners, uh, to do good human rights work, you need some partners on the ground, NGOs, journalists, uh, independent human rights institutions, most of these places, not all of them, most of them have pretty sparse civil societies. They're working under a lot of pressure. Uh, journalists are working under a lot of pressure, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Not only that, but you have the sensitivity of, of kind of the patron state. And this deal, this is not only with R Russia. For example, Claudia mentioned a trip to Crimea in 2014, six months after the uh, occupation, annexation. I went there with the agreement of both the Ukrainian and Russian authorities. The, the Russians were so angered by my report afterwards that they refused to cooperate with me until the end of my mandate. Uh, sensitivity of Cyprus with regard to doing work in northern Cyprus. I had some very fraught uh, discussions with the permanent representation in Cyprus for, to do just a short half-day visit to northern Cyprus to meet uh, there with the, with the de facto authorities. Uh, you know, so the question is, by going to one of these places, you, you very frequently anger uh, an important partner that you have to work with in the future. The only uh, easy or relatively easy places to go to uh, was Transnistria, to which I went twice, uh, and Kosovo, total case apart. Kosovo, uh, Serbia welcomed me going there. Kosovo authorities uh, facilitated my work there. We put out a nice memorandum. Uh, you know, they have the full spectrum of civil society and independent media and judiciary and so on. So it's, it's a different, it's a case mm. apart. Uh, and it should be treated as such, I think. My most sustained engagement was in eastern Ukraine. I did two visits there in 2015, 2016. Very tough to get there. Only, you know, it was with the UN and armored cars. Uh, funny, interesting stories about that, uh, getting over the six checkpoints to get there. Um, but in the end, we were very disappointed by the outcome of the work. Because we hope if you go there, you kind of get them used to going there. You, you get hope, hopefully get more and more access to places of detention. Other places, they weren't particularly interested in that. They were interested in learning, to me, how they could use the European Convention system to screw Ukraine. That was their primary interest. Uh, to get lawyers to come in from Moscow to help them file cases uh, against Ukraine. That was their, their big interest. Um, so in the end, it was a, it's a huge effort. Uh, high risks of angering uh, important countries uh, and relatively small human rights impact. Um, so a frustrating, an exercise in frustration, if you will. Thank you, and that's, um, sorry to hear that, and, and <laughs> the challenges there are self-evident. Do you feel, in relation to that, you can get sufficient backing from other member states to the convention system to endorse your visits, to endorse what you say afterwards? What, what more could member states do to, to back well, this important office? No, member states were very supportive of work there, but I think there's more that they can do other than just encouraging the commissioner or the CPT or others to go there. I mean, I, I think there needs to be a sustained political will and engagement 
to try to guarantee access to all the mechanisms, to PACE, to CPT, to the commissioner, to everybody. Um, and that really hasn't been the case. It's kind of been up and down the, the, the political engagement. I think Elena from uh, one of the previous panels, she was spot on and said, we really have to focus in on those people doing the hard human rights work on the front line in these areas. The human rights lawyers, the journalists, um, the civil society people, uh, and, and they should be much more on the radar screen of, of the Council of Europe and the member states. Involve them in, in, in cooperation projects. Uh, raise their cases, uh, raise the alarm when, when they get pressured by, by the authorities or the de facto authorities. Um, help them relocate if they need re relocation. You know, just last week, um, I think we put out in Amnesty a big uh, alarm about three uh, human rights lawyers in Crimea. These are the people on the front line helping people to use the system, and if they can't work, then the system can't work at all. Um, but I think also, you have action plans in some of these countries. Um, you know, in some of the, kind of the, the par what, do you, what, would you, what would you call them? The, the country which, from which these territories are, are trying to break away or, or uh, being pulled away by, by neighboring states. There are action plans in some of these countries that need to take more into account the, these NGOs and, uh, and other players. But in the end, it's a, it's a, it's a political issue. And the, the elephant in the room all day today has been, you know, two of the biggest players for these conflict areas are Russia and Turkey. Two big countries that nobody really wants to pick a fight with. Mm. <laughs> and if you don't want to pick a fight with them, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna get very far in any of these places. So it's a question is, to what extent does a country have an appetite, uh, a member state have a, or the Council of Europe in general, have an appetite to pick a fight with a, a wealthy, powerful, important country in the Council of Europe? And you mentioned Russia there, thank you, of course. Um, and we are now in a different position with respect to that country than would have been the case this time last year, of course. And it begs the question, ever challenging question, what now can be done to improve the situation of relationship of human rights in those gray areas with respect to uh, that R Russia still controls? Or yeah, if the, if the game was tough, tough before, I think it's, it's, mm. it's even tougher now. I mean, I, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is to make sure that Russia's departure doesn't mean that other parts of the Council of Europe or, or activities of the Council of Europe are getting less funding. So other member states have to step up and fill the gap that Russia's departure um, has left. Um, I think that both the Committee of Ministers and, and, and the court should give prompt consideration to the, to the cases, uh, the interstate cases, but also the cases stemming from these, from these areas and, and look at implementation. Um, I think since the invasion of, of Ukraine, the issue of collecting evidence of, of war crimes and, and crimes against humanity um, you know, should be a huge focus on gathering, collecting, and preserving this evidence. We know how long these cases take internationally. Uh, but also, uh, the Council of Europe can push, uh, push member states have not done so to ratify the, the statute of the ICC and to adopt legislation on universal jurisdiction. Um, I think that's that's the way forward. But politically, um, it's a tough game. I mean, each of the Moldova, Georgia, um, uh, and Ukraine each have ministries of reintegration or structures looking at these areas. Now, these these structures need to be strengthened. Uh, need to help them with strategic communications to work so that they can try to reach the the target populations of of the conflict areas. Um, if member states of the Council of Europe engage in these areas, they should by all means avoid doing anything that would strengthen the legitimacy or the statehood uh, of, of these places, but to work on basic security, for example, demining or democratization. And of course, people-to-people -people contacts, confidence building measures, which are mentioned, these are key. Uh, my neighbor here can probably tell much more about these than, than me. Um, and in the end, the peacekeeping format. You know, this is, this, we're far from human rights now. Uh, mm -hmm. But the peacekeeping format has basically created a pr protective wall uh, for these breakaway territories. So as long as you have CIS or, or Russian peacekeepers there, not a whole lot's going to change on the ground. So we should support politically uh, the states, in, you know, the, the affected states in, in changing the format. But this is, again, we're very far from human rights here. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Neil. There's a lot packed in there, and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions about uh, all that in a little while, as well as an opportunity for you to just add a third, a few thoughts. But I'll now turn, if I may, to Nino Lomniaria, um, just introduced there, uh, who is a public defender of Georgia, and further details are in our information pack. Um, Nino, thank you very much for joining thank us you. today. Um, we uh, wanted to ask you then about your role as public defender, um, perhaps to start therefore by saying a little bit about that role mm -hmm. um, and what your institution, um, uh, 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 what role it, it function it has in these contested areas, for example. Thank you Ed, for asking me this question. Um, dear colleagues, this is my honor to be here, to be invited as a speaker, to take part in this very important conference, which dedic is dedicated to explore how the um, ECHR system can become more effective in conflict-affected European territories. And this topic is especially relevant today um, in light of the ongoing Russian invasion in Ukraine and is of special importance to me as a public defender of Georgia, a country with territories occupied uh, by Russian. Before I move uh, 